Hello, everyone. Hello, Master. We're so blessed today. Why? Today, we're going to learn about the story of Earth Store Bodhisattva. Whenever I teach about sutras, I always read the original text and explain the meaning in more simple terms. This will help you understand better and more easily. Each person perceives sutras differently, and that's normal. What's important is to understand what you read. Instead of creating conflicts out of different opinions, what's important is to learn the values of Earth Store Bodhisattva. In Mahayana Buddhism, Earth Store Bodhisattva is a highly regarded Bodhisattva. His existence embodies one of the ultimate laws of nature. Which is the law we call causality. Simply put, it's called paying for what we do. How do we pay our debts? This sutra has all the answers. Now, I will begin to explain the Earth Store Sutra. The first chapter, Supernormal Powers in the Trayastrimsa Heaven. Thus I have heard, this is a common line in all sutras. The time period in which Buddha lived was about 2,600 years ago. At the time of the Buddha, there were no recorders or cameras, and people weren't that educated about language back then. I've never been told that sutras were written at the same time as when the Buddha was expounding Dharma. So who says the line, thus I have heard? According to records of Buddhism, after Buddha's passing, his disciples would gather and recall his teachings. How many times did they gather? Many times. When Buddha's disciples gathered, they'd recall many things from Buddha's teachings to where the teachings were delivered. So, when the prominent disciples of the Buddha recalled some past teachings, the content of what they recalled was compiled into sutras. I think the sutras are all very complete. I don't have any doubts about them. This Earth Store Sutra is a complete sutra. That has enlightened me greatly. So, here, it says, thus I have heard. It means the person saying this is recalling a Dharma teaching session by the Buddha. Again, this was not recorded while Buddha was expounding Dharma. This is the Buddha's disciples recalling his teachings. At one time, the Buddha was in the Trayastrimsa heaven. Expounding Dharma for his mother, the Trayastrimsa heaven means the heaven of 33 gods in ancient Sanskrit. This translation shows the way the ancient Indians perceived heavens. It's quite similar to how the ancient Chinese perceived heavens. I recall that in Chinese folklore, the heavens consist of 36 levels. 
Is that a coincidence? Now, back to the heaven of the 33 gods. Treyastrimsa is on the second level of the desire realm. It's not the highest level. The different heavenly realms include the desire realm. Desire means you have needs, wants, and wishes. That's what it means. And then, the form realm. These three realms are very big with lots of levels in each. And finally, the formless realm. In the desire realm, the beings there have a lower state of achievement. The first level of the desire realm is called heaven of the four heavenly kings. The second level is called the Treyastrimsa heaven. The third level is called the Suyama heaven. The fourth level is called the Tusita heaven. The fifth level is called the heaven of delight in transformations. And lastly, the heaven of mastery over others' transformations. These six levels make up the desire realm. This realm is inhabited by those who desire. In Treyastrimsa heaven, the inhabitant's height could reach more than a yojana. A yojana is a measurement of distance used in ancient India. One yojana is about 17.5 kilometers in today's day and age. That's tall. In this level of heaven, time passes differently. The inhabitants of this heaven can live up to 1,000 years in that realm. The beings there can be a thousand years old, that is about 36 million years in our human realm. To earthlings like us, that's an extremely long lifespan. But it's not long amongst all the heavenly realms. That's just average. The lifespan in each level is different. In this realm, the inhabitants still have desires. And gender, too, if I'm not wrong, this is just a little extra information for you. Now, back to the Sutra. Thus have I heard. At one time, Buddha was in the Treyastrimsa heaven expounding Dharma for his mother. At that time, from countless worlds of the ten directions, all Buddhas and great Bodhisattva Mahasattvas, inexpressibly inexpressible many, all came and assembled there. You heard it, inexpressibly inexpressible many. That means a lot. They'd come to listen to Buddha's teaching. All the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas had nothing but praise for Sakyamuni Buddha who expounded Dharma for his mother. They'd all come to join and participate in this auspicious occasion. Everyone was overjoyed and voicing their praise. I'll just skip what they said. At that time, Sakyamuni Buddha smiled and emitted hundreds of thousands of millions of clouds of greater illumination. Don't ask why they appeared. They just appeared with Buddha's smile. A countless number of colorful clouds. There were great clouds of illumination, compassion, prajna, auspiciousness, merits, fortune and etc. In short, all the positive qualities you can imagine are appearing in the form of clouds. I think they represent auspiciousness. The clouds formed because inexpressibly inexpressible many deities all gathered there together. The clouds are all auspicious energy. That's how it is. We're talking about all beings in all the worlds that are associated with good qualities. When they appear, they bring good energy with them. Where they gather, auspiciousness will follow. That's how it is. That explains the appearance of the clouds. It's how the heavens sing praise for such an auspicious scene. And then, in Treyastrimsa heaven, all kinds of beautiful sounds can be heard.
They were the sound of compassion, the sound of joyous giving, the sound of liberation, of wisdom and auspiciousness, and the sound of the lion's roar. You may have heard of some of them in some other teachings. After the sounds, countless millions of heavenly beings, dragon-like beings, ghosts and deities also assembled in the palace of the Treyastrimsa heaven. And there were beings from other heavens and realms as well. We're talking about the desire, form and formless realms and other divine beings and different forms of life from each level of the heavens have all gathered here. The sutra also mentioned deities from other lands and the Saha world, such as the night deities, deities of happiness, deities of liberation, etc., have also come to gather. Don't forget the deities who make people shiver, such as the evil-eyed ghost king, the blood-consuming ghost king, etc. These are deities of the underworld who govern the dead. They're important too. People associate death with annihilation and doomsday. That's why they fear death. People often think that deities of the underworld bear a terrifying and scary appearance. No, it's not true. While they govern the dead, they also give you a chance to be reborn. How can deities with such a noble task look scary? Only ghosts that come to retaliate because of your misdeeds bear a gruesome appearance. Deities that control death and rebirth don't have that gruesome look. So, many ghost kings from underworld realms came. The evil-eyed ghost king, the blood-consuming ghost king, the vital energy-consuming ghost king, the disease-spreading ghost king, the poison-controlling ghost king, the kind-hearted ghost king, the without poison ghost king, the ghost king of welfare, the ghost king of blessings and benefit, etc. There were many ghost kings. Each underworld realm has a deity who watches over it. We don't know how many underworld realms there are. In short, almost all deities of the underworld have gathered. What a sight to behold! It's a gathering of deities across realms and heavens. Here, Manjusri Bodhisattva is mentioned. The sutras tend to call the Bodhisattva of Wisdom by his name, Manjusri. At that time, Sakyamuni Buddha said to Manjusri, Dharma Prince, Bodhisattva Mahasattva, look at all the Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, heavenly beings. Deities from this and other worlds, from this and other lands. Do you know how many of them there are? Even a bodhisattva as wise as Manjusri had a hard time guessing how many deities there were. Manjusri replied Buddha, world honored one. Even if I were to measure and calculate with my supernormal powers for a thousand eons, I would not be able to know it. At that time, even the mighty Buddha did not know the answer, for the immeasurable beings who had gathered were all liberated by earth store bodhisattva throughout many long eons. How much time is that? One eon is about a few billion years. How can you count the lives saved by Earth Store Bodhisattva? Over billions of years? No way. Immeasurable. The Treyastrimsa heaven needed to be expanded a lot to fit all of them. Tickets would be sold out quickly if they were buying. Well, what do you expect? We're talking about the number of beings saved by Earth Store Bodhisattva over a countless number of years. Yes, the deities and underworld kings were all saved by Earth Store Bodhisattva. Manjusri said to the Buddha, World Honored One. In the past I have long cultivated virtuous roots and have attained unobstructed wisdom, 
Therefore, when I hear what the Buddha says, I immediately believe and accept it. That's Manjusri showing his faith in Buddha's teachings. If that's what he was told, then he'd accept it without doubt. However, there was one thing that was bothering Manjusri. What if the beings of small attainment, the eight legions of heavenly beings and dragon-like beings, as well as sentient beings in the future, had doubts even after they heard the words of Buddha? Manjusri further added that, even if they receive these words most respectfully, they may still be unable to avoid slandering them. If this was the case, World Honored One, please speak in detail about what practices Earth Store Bodhisattva Mahasattva cultivated and what vows he made during his causal states of cultivation that have enabled him to accomplish such inconceivable deeds. The Buddha told Manjusri, as an analogy, suppose all the grasses, trees, thickets, forests, cereal crops, flax plants, bamboos, reeds, mountains, stones, and dust particles, in a third-order world system of a billion worlds, were each counted as a unit. For each unit there would be a Ganges river. That's not all. For each grain of sand in these Ganges rivers, there would be a world containing more worlds. This is what I call mind-boggling. It means the amount of merits. Earth Store Bodhisattva has is immeasurable. How can anyone count that? Why are so many deities gathered in the Trayastrimsa heaven? For billions of years, Earth Store Bodhisattva has been saving all kinds of beings. The amount described in this sutra is beyond our imagination. That's for sure. No way could we count the grains of sand in a normal river, let alone the Ganges River. There's no exact figure for this. Here comes more. Within each grain of sand, there is another world. And within these worlds, there are more Ganges rivers. How do you count the number of sand grains in these Ganges rivers? There's no way. I can't even translate this. I'll just tell you what you need to know. There's no answer to the question. How much merit does Earth Store Bodhisattva have? The answer is, immeasurable merit. Look how Buddha describes Earth Store Bodhisattva's merits. That tells you about Earth Store Bodhisattva. There's more, Buddha added, the time since Earth Store Bodhisattva reached. The tenth stage of attainment is thousands of times greater than that of the above analogy. This is beyond our understanding and comprehension. Sakyamuni Buddha further added, Manjusri, the majesty, divine power and great vow of this bodhisattva are inconceivable. In the future, there may be kind men and kind women who hear this bodhisattva's name. If they praise, gaze at him, pay reverence, chant his name or make offerings, if they paint, carve, sculpt or use lacquer to make his image, these people will be reborn a hundred times in the thirty-three heavens and will never fall into the evil realms. Do you understand what it means? According to the Buddha, it's easy to gain merits. You just praise, chant Earth Store Bodhisattva's name, 
make offerings to him or build statues of him. You can do all these. The merits obtained from all these will allow you to be reborn 100 times in the Trayastrimsa heaven. We're talking about the heaven which Sakyamuni Buddha's mother is living in. You'll be reborn 100 times and will never fall into the evil realms. For this to happen, your bad karma must be erased. How is this possible? This is the power of earth store Bodhisattva, who achieved his enlightenment by liberating people's lives endlessly. You'll be blessed if you praise him. Sakyamuni Buddha then told Manjushri, in the distant past, an inexpressibly inexpressible number of eons ago, perhaps probably billions of years ago, that earth store Bodhisattva was someone else. Reincarnation is a concept taught in Buddhism. In your previous lifetimes, you could be a woman, man, or even an animal. Here, the sutra says, that earth store Bodhisattva was once reincarnated as the son of a great elder. That's what the sutra says. An elder was probably someone who was respected by the people. That elder was blessed with a son, and that was earth store Bodhisattva's previous reincarnation. At that time, there was a Buddha called Lion Swift Rousing Perfect in 10,000 Practices to Thagata. Once, the elder's son was blessed with a chance to see the appearance of the aforementioned Buddha. After glancing at the Buddha's appearance, the elder's son knew that was an auspicious appearance no ordinary man could bear. He quickly showed his admiration and inquired of that Buddha what practices he had cultivated and what vows he had made to achieve these signs of excellence. He couldn't hide his excitement. There was no evil intention from him, just sincerity and curiosity. Then, the Buddha told the elder son what he must do to be blessed with such an auspicious appearance. You must guide all suffering beings to liberation throughout a very long time. That was the Buddha's answer. At that moment, the elder son vowed to do as he was told. This encounter was also fated. If it was someone else, they might have called the Buddha a swindler. They would not believe his words. The elder son didn't even doubt the Buddha. The sutra began with Sakyamuni Buddha expounding Dharma for his mother. That was followed by a conversation between him and Manjushri. And now, a story of the son of the elder. Look how the time and space keep changing here. Then, Sakyaman is said, Manjushri, the elder son hence made a vow, saying, from now on, throughout incalculable eons in the future, I will employ many skillful means for the sake of sinning, suffering beings in the six realms of samsara, and help them to attain liberation. Only after that will I myself attain Buddhahood. That's the vow the elder son made. Does this sound strange to you, or do you think this is just a coincidence? I don't think so, not for me. 
regardless of how earth store bodhisattva was incarnated. He was blessed with the ultimate wisdom and understanding capacity. Did he do enough good deeds in his previous lifetimes? Of course. If not, he wouldn't be blessed enough to meet a Buddha as the elder's son. And he wouldn't be aspired as such to make such a great vow. He must have accumulated lots of merits from doing lots of good deeds in his previous lifetimes. No way could he make such a great vow if he wasn't blessed. With the ultimate wisdom and understanding capacity, Sakyamuni Buddha further added, He made such a great vow in front of that Buddha. Now, hundreds of thousands of millions of Nayudas of inexpressible eons later, he is still a Bodhisattva. Yes, he's still waiting to become a full-fledged Buddha. Now, that's interesting and worth thinking deeper about. I'm sure you're wondering, why even after helping so many beings, he's still a bodhisattva, we'll talk about this later. Next, moreover in the past, inconceivable Asamkhya's eons ago, this part talks about another time space too, in an indescribable amount of time in the past. In the world there was a Buddha named Awakening Blossom Samadhi Mastery King Tathagata. The lifespan of that Buddha was 400,000 million Asakiya's eons. You can't count the lifespan of a Buddha, because a Buddha doesn't perish. Is there such a life form? I believe there is. The lifespan of humans is too short. Humans can live up to 120 years at most. Can a human live for 300 years? No way. The oldest rocks that have been found are about 3.8 billion years old. Compared to other planets in the solar system, Earth is not the oldest. The size of Earth is like a tiny cell in the whole universe. Think out of the box, beyond Earth and the solar system, could life forms that live for billions of years exist? Why not? It's perfectly fine and reasonable to say that. During that time of this great Buddha, it was the age of semblance dharma. This means the physical body of that Buddha no longer existed at that time. When people made offerings to this Buddha, they were made to his image. Here, Sakyamuni Buddha is telling another story. During that period of time, there was a Brahmin woman. What does a Brahmin woman mean? Brahmin, or Brahmin, refers to a caste within the old Hindu society. The Brahmins belonged to the priestly class. For generations, they'd served as priests, religious teachers, and even spirit mediums. You know, people who could communicate with the dead. Those who belonged to the Brahmin class were highly respected. During the age of Awakening Blossom Samadhi Mastery King Tathagata, there was a Brahmin woman who had ample profound merits from previous lives. It means she did many good deeds in her previous lifetimes. Her kindness was obvious. She treated people nicely. It was a beautiful start, and then things turned ugly. 
Being a highly respected Brahmin family, the girl's family must have been rich and wealthy, right? You can expect they had servants to look after them, and their own farmers to work in their farms. This girl was kind-hearted and an obedient child. Her mother, however, believed in false doctrines. And often slighted the three jewels. To put it simply, she didn't believe in Buddha's teachings. She even belittled the three jewels of Buddhism. The three jewels are Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. In our current time, we understand that different religious views exist, and it's normal. This evil mother was slandering and accusing Buddha. And all those who practiced Buddha's teachings. Her daughter used various methods to guide her mother back onto the right path, but to no avail. And the mother passed away soon after. Her daughter knew that her mother would certainly be reborn in the evil realms in accordance with her karma to liberate her mother from hell. She did one thing no modern person would do. She sold the family house and bought incense, flowers and various objects worthy of being offered. She offered these items to Awakening Blossom Samadhi Mastery King Tathagata's stupas and monasteries. What a remarkable girl! In one of the monasteries, she saw the Buddha's image. She had nothing but respect and reverence for what she saw. She then closed her eyes and thought to herself. The Buddha is called the Great Awakened One, perfectly complete with all wisdom. If this Buddha is in the world, and I were to inquire of him about my mother's death, he would certainly know where she is. The girl wept for a long time, as she gazed up longingly at the Buddha. She was a very filial daughter. Although she knew what kind of a person her mother was, she still chanted to the Buddha for her mother. Suddenly she heard a voice in the sky saying, Weeping holy woman, do not be so sorrowful. I will show you where your mother has gone. That's what she heard. She was overwhelmed. She then put her palms together and thanked the Buddha. She said, ever since I lost my mother, I have held her in memory day and night. There is nowhere that I can ask about the realm of her rebirth. A voice again resounded in the sky, telling her, I am the one to whom you gaze reverently and paid respect, the past awakening blossom Samadhi, Mastery King Tathagata. I have seen that you think of your mother many more times than ordinary beings do of theirs. Therefore, I have come to show you where she is. The girl was so moved by what she heard. I think she was more than just moved. Why? Out of her love for her mother, the girl cast her entire body forward to prostrate herself. In ancient Indian society, people showed their great respect. 
by doing a full prostration on the ground. A full prostration requires one to rest their arms and feet, as well as their heads on the ground. This girl just jumped up and threw herself on the ground, and ended up injuring herself in the process. She injured her limbs and was knocked out cold. Yes, she really fainted. Being a girl from a wealthy family, she had servants following her everywhere. So her servants quickly came to her rescue. They spent quite a long time helping her recover. As she regained consciousness, she looked at the sky and begged the Buddha again to tell her the whereabouts of her mother. Awakening Blossom Samadhi Mastery King Tathagata told the girl, After your offering is complete, go home quickly. Find a quiet room. Sit upright and meditate on my name. You must focus your thoughts. Don't think about anything else. Meditate and chant my name. You will soon know where your mother has been reborn. After the girl paid reverence to this Buddha, she returned home immediately. As she thought of her mother, she sat upright, meditating on the name of Awakening Blossom Samadhi Mastery King Tathagata. For a day and a night, suddenly, she saw herself beside a sea whose waters seethed. Imagine an entire sea being heated, it's bubbling just like a pot of boiling water. The sutra mentions that the girl saw men and women on the sea, moving everywhere while trying to avoid being devoured by evil beasts with iron bodies stalking on the sea. Imagine beasts with iron bodies and huge iron teeth chasing after people on the sea, tearing them limb from limb, biting through bone and flesh and smashing heads. The girl also saw yaksas with different appearances. Yaksas are not ghosts, they're more demon-like. So what kind of yaksas did the girl see? Some had many hands, some many eyes, some many feet, and some many heads. The beasts had huge tusks to tear their prey apart. Once their prey got caught, they couldn't escape. That's how the iron beasts are described in the sutra. Yaksas are demons with many different appearances. Some have several heads, mouths, feet, claws, etc. What did they do? They drove people on the sea to where the iron beasts were at. They also grabbed people by their heads and feet, and threw them to the iron beasts. What a cruel and bloody massacre. At that time, the girl wasn't afraid at all. Thanks to the Buddha's blessings, she was blessed with composure thanks to her good deeds in the past. She was firm as a rock and unafraid of what she saw before her. Then, she was approached by a ghost king. This was not a low-ranking ghost. The ghost king's name was Poisonless. There, he approached the girl and greeted her. Excellent. For what reason has Bodhisattva come here? He's asking this Brahmin girl. The girl asked the ghost king, what is this place? Poisonless replied, this is the first of the seas west of the great iron enclosed mountains. The girl asked, 
I have heard that hells are within the iron enclosed mountains. Is this really so? Poisonless replied, there really are hells. The girl asked, now, how have I come to the hells? Poisonless replied that there could only be two reasons. Either the girl was blessed with the Buddha's power, or she had sinned so much that she was banished to hell. Hell is where the sinners are. That was it. It was either by the Buddha's blessings, or her own evil karma. The girl asked further, why is this water seething? Why are there so many wrongdoers and evil beasts? Poisonless replied, These are souls of mortals who have recently done evil. These were the souls of bad guys who had sinned a lot and had just died recently. They were fresh, they just died not more than 49 days earlier. Only those who had sinned a lot were banished to hell, remember? That's why their souls were brought there to suffer. These souls would be eaten by the evil beasts. Then they got revived and were eaten again. They had to suffer endlessly because of their sins. Here, the Sutra also mentions, for these souls that were suffering in this sea, in the 49 days since their passing, their descendants hadn't done any good deeds on their behalf. No good deeds, no chanting, light offering, etc. That's why their souls were brought there to suffer endlessly. And then, they awaited judgment. Before being judged, they had to suffer first. Now, this girl, the holy woman, in the sutra, asked further. Where are the hells? Yes, this sea is called, the sea of sufferings. It's not hell. Poisonless replied, here are three seas. Within the three seas are the great hells. They number in the hundreds of thousands, and each one is different. There are 18 levels of great hell. That's the 18 levels of hell we often talk about. And then there are more than 500 other types of middle hells. There are several thousand smaller hells. All hells have one similarity, you are tortured endlessly. Scary, right? You haven't heard the scariest part yet. The girl then asked further about her mother's whereabouts. Then, Poisonless asked her, what actions did the Bodhisattva's mother do habitually, while she was alive? The girl then answered honestly, My mother held false views, and she ridiculed and slandered the three jewels. I often told her to stop her wrongdoings, even when she temporarily believed. She would quickly become disrespectful again. That's how the girl's mother was. Then the girl said further, she passed away recently. I do not know where she has been reborn. Poisonless asked, what was the name and clan of the Bodhisattva's mother? The girl answered, my parents were both Brahmins. My father's name was Silas Shantien, and my mother's name was Udili. After knowing who the girl's mother was, and how many offerings the girl had made to the Buddha over the years, Poisonless knew that the girl's mother had long since been liberated from hell. He put his palms together and said, Holy One, please return to your home. Do not be worried or sorrowful in remembering. For the woman wrongdoer Udili was reborn in heaven three days ago. 
It was the girl's filial piety and her constant offerings. For awakening blossom Samadhi Mastery King Tathagata, that got her mother liberated from hell and ascended to heaven. After telling the girl all that, Poisonless put his palms together and left. At that moment, the girl woke up from her dream. Yes, all this happened while she was chanting at home. She traveled spiritually to another time and space. Everything felt like a dream to her. The girl woke up from her dream as soon as Poisonless left. To her, it may seem like a dream. For us, try to think of this as time and space travel, okay? The girl then made an immense vow before the image and stupa of Awakening Blossom Samadhi Mastery King Tathagata. She vowed, I vow that throughout the future eons, I will employ many skillful means to help all sinning, suffering beings attain liberation. Only a noble person such as this could make such a vow. Most people wouldn't care anymore once they knew their mother was out of hell. The most they do is just offer an incense once a year, that's it. Not this girl. She went back to the stupa to make a grand vow. What a great character. How touching. Back to the Buddha's lesson at the Trayastrimsa heaven. The Buddha told Manjusri, Ghost King Poisonless is now leader in wealth Bodhisattva. The Brahmin woman is now Earth Store Bodhisattva. What a moving story. It's hard for us to understand how a person was blessed with such great kindness and made such a grand vow. This girl is a perfect learning example, a role model. Master, I have a question. The sutra mentions that Earth Store Bodhisattva was an elder's son in his previous lifetime, right? When, as the elder's son, he saw the Buddha. He vowed to liberate all beings just like the Buddha does. As a young man without any self-cultivation practices, he made that great vow from his admiration of the Buddha. Is that possible? Good question. The vows we make reflect our states of mind. So it is normal to assume that without some spiritual cultivation, it is impossible for us to make such a great vow. We're aware that Earth Store Bodhisattva has had many previous lifetimes. Regardless of the form he was incarnated into, he was carrying merits accumulated from the past. That's what led to his admiration and his vow. As the elder son, even if his state of mind wasn't that high, once he was moved by Buddha, thanks to his merits from the past, he knew how to pay back his debts, giving way more than he received. You do that when you really want to pay back someone who saved your life. Or, you helped me move in the past. In the future, I'll help build your home. It means to repay kindness many folds over. Now that's what I call showing your gratitude. In his previous lifetimes, 
earth store bodhisattva, was only an ordinary human being with an ordinary state of mind. Thanks to his merits from the past, he received the Buddha's blessings. He wanted to pay back more than what he received. But he didn't know how to pay back, so he made such a great vow. He made such a great vow because he had no idea how to pay back. And he vowed to liberate all souls in hell. His siblings and best friends would have doubted him or poured cold water on him. They would have asked him questions like, do you have what it takes, such as wisdom, dharma power, merits and virtues, capacity and resilience, or, you're just talking big. Normal people will say these things. Those who are honest with you are your true friends. It's logical, a big vow is easier said than done. The thing is, you can't always be logical when it comes to Buddhism. Buddhism is not always one plus one is equal to two. I'm not sure if it exists in math but for example, we take one. Suddenly, it's like magic and turns into 10,000, then it transforms again into 1 million. Is it possible? In my opinion, it is possible. Miracles don't happen in math, they do in Buddhism. So, why not? In Buddhism, 1 plus 1 can equal 1 million. In Buddhism, a vow is never too big when you are sincere and motivated. The aspiration to move a mountain sounds stupid, but sometimes we do need this kind of stupidity to succeed. Wealthy and successful people weren't born smart. It's just that they're persistent in pursuing their goals. That's how they succeeded. Enlightened Buddhists weren't born smart either. It's just that they're persistent in achieving what they vowed to do. That's what I think. The way they pursue their goals is beyond our logical expectations. The teachings of Buddhism are not that complicated. Look at the concept of causality. It teaches us that when you give help, you'll receive help. What else? You'll look better when you practice compassion. It's like saying you'll lose weight when you exercise. See, it's not rocket science, but it works. That doesn't mean that miracles don't happen in Buddhism. In Buddhism, the moment of aspiration brings the Buddha to you. Can an ignorant and incapable person be enlightened? We're talking about someone who knows nothing. About terms such as hell, liberation, all beings, nothing. Someone who knows nothing but makes a great vow out of great aspiration. Will this person be blessed? Yes. Of course, great aspiration brings great wisdom and power. That's the miraculous part of Buddhism. No science could explain this. If you're weak, poor, and have no wisdom, great powers will be bestowed upon you when your sincere aspiration is sensed. How? It's secret. Secrets will remain secrets. I don't have the answer, but I'm not bluffing. The thing is, you can't just make a vow and then do nothing. Nothing works that way. Although all events should be analyzed individually. In Buddhism, everything is possible with a sincere aspiration. And then, difficult things will become easy. Why? Because a great aspiration brings wisdom and power. Master, here's another question. The Brahmin girl was obedient. She was extremely filial and a very kind daughter. Her mother was banished to hell for disrespecting the three jewels. The girl never stopped making offerings, so that her mother was sent to a better place, right? 
How is it possible that an evil mother was blessed with such a good daughter? What led to such a fortunate blessing? Nobody knows what they were like before their rebirth. The evil mother had more life experiences than her daughter. But the daughter knew more about kindness and compassion. How? She was born with it. It's a blessing. All kids are born angelic. They wouldn't hurt even a bug. If you tell them to step on a bug, they'd say no. If you say you're going to kill a rabbit and it'll get bloody, they'd probably cry and stop you. They'll want to protect the rabbit. That's what most children would do. They're angels by nature. Some children may be different. You tell a kid about turning a live rabbit into rabbit stew, he gets excited and even helps you with the killing. This kid then carries some bad karma. Everyone is blessed differently at birth. If a three-year-old is good at stealing toys, pencils and erasers, where do you think such talent came from? From his previous incarnation, right? What was this kid like in the past? A thief, right? If they put such talent into practice in the present lifetime, punishments shall await them. Everyone's merits and karma from the past are different. Parents don't necessarily have more merits than children. Children don't necessarily have fewer merits than their parents. Our merits are accumulated at present and in the previous lifetimes. It's like saving money for a long time and then moving to a new place. There, nobody knows how much money you have. In fact, you've saved up quite a fortune. Unlike most people, you've been saving up for a long time. So the Brahmin girl's mother having less merits than her daughter is normal. Thank you, Master. I now know that filial piety is not blind obedience. It's about having right views, correcting your parents' evil views, and leading them back to the righteous path. We all need to learn to do this. This girl has never stopped being filial. When her mother was still alive, she had been correcting her mother's evil views. After her mother had passed, she knew she had to do something. She knew that for what her mother had done, hell was the only place for her. Even so, she was still eager to save her mother. This is true kindness, compassion and filial piety. That's why she was reborn as Earth Store Bodhisattva. What a touching story. Earth Store Bodhisattva has lived immeasurable past lifetimes to get to his Buddhahood. His great compassion is indeed beyond words. He has countless manifestations liberating the beings in hell. What an achievement. When Sakyamuni Buddha talks about Earth Store Bodhisattva, he is reminding us that the latter is bracing through all obstacles to liberate all beings in hell. It's done so that we don't suffer at present or in the future. Chapter 2 The Assembly of the Manifestations During this time, in the countless and limitless worlds, there are immeasurable manifestations of Earth Store Bodhisattva in all the hells. Let me explain to you. Normally, the humans on Earth think that there is only one or several hells in this human world. When the Buddha was teaching in the Trayastrimsa, he said that there were a certain number of these human or celestial worlds. 
and various realms, such as the Desire Realm and Hell, existing in these different worlds. Later, when Earth's store Bodhisattva achieved a certain cultivation state, he could manifest in the hells of the different worlds to save the suffering beings there. Thus, the Buddha said at that time, in the hells of the countless and limitless worlds, almost all the earth store bodhisattva's manifestations gathered in Trayastrimsa. How many of them? Even Buddha couldn't count them all. All the earth store bodhisattva's manifestations came with the blessing of the Buddha. All the beings that earth store bodhisattva helped had come too. They were holding all kinds of gifts, which they thought were good enough to offer to the Buddha, such as incense and flowers. Who were these for? Sakyamuni Buddha. Because everything they have is from Buddha's teaching. This is fundamental. They came to this world to make the offering. The Buddha said that all these beings, through eons of time, which means since long, long ago, were constantly reincarnating within the six realms and suffering and were being helped and taught by Earth Store Bodhisattva. Also, they had achieved a certain fruition of enlightenment. In Buddhism, fruit or fruition achieved are used to express a certain level we've reached through practicing. They've all achieved certain fruition and will not regress. Earth Store Bodhisattva had used lots of time in helping and teaching. These beings that were saved by him and made the offerings now had achieved the non-retracting fruition. They were the bodhisattvas, arhats or other fruitions, all of which are non-retracting fruitions, because they'd been taught for a very long time and had come to Trayastrimsa. They felt extremely excited to admire and revere. They worshipped the Buddha with such a great admiration and reverence that they didn't want to move their eyes away from the Buddha for a moment. They all benefited from Buddha's gracious blessings through Earth Store Bodhisattva's teaching. It all arose from the bottom of their hearts. At this time, Sakyamuni Buddha stretched out his elegant golden arm and used his supernatural power. Remember its supernatural power to touch earth store Bodhisattva's head, including all his countless manifestations, giving them crown empowerment. Since immeasurable manifestations of earth store Bodhisattva had come, Buddha performed crown empowerment on these bodhisattva manifestations with supernatural power to bless them. It's amazing, just like watching a movie. He also warned, I'm in this five poison evil world, teaching these extremely stubborn beings. If their mind can be tamed and taught, or become softer and stay away from the evil and start doing good, it would be nice. Let them return to the right path of compassionate dharma. But one or two of ten still cling to their bad habits. They don't respect and trust you. They don't give up their evil thoughts. Many sentient beings, through my numerous times of convenient teachings, have made changes and transformation. Helping people is difficult. 
Well, even the Buddha was feeling this way. To whom was Buddha talking? Earth store Bodhisattva. For all kinds of people and conditions, we use all kinds of possibilities and methods or flexibility and convenience to help them. Sometimes, the Buddha manifested in a male appearance. Say, you trust in an old professor. You say, I won't believe in anybody but the professor. The Buddha would appear as a professor. Some say, I only believe in Einstein, the real scientist. The Buddha then appears as Einstein, and preaches in a scientific way. You will believe that's the truth. If Buddha is not in the image of Einstein, you won't believe what he says. It happens. Some may say, I don't believe in men. I only trust women. He will become a she. Some hate female professors. Then what? If you like a noble lady, the Buddha manifests as a noble lady. If you like a girl, he manifests as a girl. He manifests into various identities just to help you understand and be educated to get back on the right track. Therefore, Buddha said, I will turn into all kinds of appearances and identities from as high as a king, government official, wealthy man, a Buddhist practitioner, or even a great monk you like. Or, if you don't like a monk but prefer a nun, I could appear as a nun. Anyone from a scholar to a self-cultivator, as you like. I'll manifest various identities and methods to help them. But still many people are not following. You can see I've been trying for so long, from the ancient time up till now. Very hard and diligently to teach and help all these stubborn people. Many of them are still not accepting and listening to me. There's no other way because it's the consequence of causality. Many of them will fall onto the evil path. Even if they've learned from me before, they'll still fall onto the evil path, the hell. These suffering beings, when they fall into hell and get punished, this part is addressed to the earth store bodhisattva, because he can feel the sentient being's pain. The Buddha told Earth Store Bodhisattva, You must remember what I tell you today. Your hard work and dedication towards saving and teaching these suffering beings must be persistent. Also, patiently use all kinds of convenient, flexible, tolerant, forgiving, and absolutely compassionate methods to help, teach and save them. You must persevere unremittingly. Until when? When the future Buddha, Mithraya, arrives. Your job is done. At this time, all the countless manifestations of Earth Store Bodhisattva, there were many of them instantly combined as one with the true body of Earth Store Bodhisattva. He was in tears and deeply grateful for the advice and teaching of Sakyamuni Buddha. He expressed his gratitude and said, Since immeasurable eons ago, I came from far, far away. Under the guidance of Buddha, I gained unbelievable divine supernatural power and perfect limitless wisdom. My manifestations exist in trillions of worlds like the sands in the Ganges. That means in each of these countless worlds exist countless manifestations of me, and each can help countless beings. I can make them follow and worship the three treasures.
and leave the six realms and reincarnation forever. This is the gratitude that Earth Store Bodhisattva expressed to the Buddha. It was truly a very touching expression. Among these people, if they follow Buddha's compassionate way to do good deeds, even if it's a trivial matter as light as a feather or as tiny as a grain of sand, such a good deed will yield merits and virtues. I'll try to save them from falling into hell. Eliminate their previous sins and liberate them from the six realms. So, please don't worry, my Buddha. I can assure you that all the future crime committing sentient beings will get my help. I'll do my best. That's it. He said that three times to reassure Buddha. He's truly an ambassador for the Buddha. I'm moved. Then, after listening to Earth Store Bodhisattva, the Buddha praised Earth Store Bodhisattva. What a great vision you have. I will help you to attain such a beautiful goal too. You've come here from a very far away time and space. To save all the sentient beings and make such a great vow. Once you have saved all these sentient beings, you'll achieve perfect enlightenment and Buddhahood immediately. That's the wish Buddha granted to him. I'm very moved as I'm telling you. Well, since he'd helped so many people already, hadn't he attained Buddhahood yet? Actually, he already had a long time ago. Then why is he not using a Buddha name? I'll leave this to you to think about it. In the Sutra, it is stated, that sentient beings are difficult to tame and teach because many evil behaviors are quite seductive. Evilness is tempting and oftentimes, goodness is the opposite. Evil attracts people more easily. For example, after drinking a lot, people may act crazy. Once you continuously drink for three years, it's hard for you to quit. What is printed on cigarette boxes? Smoking is hazardous to health and causes all kinds of illnesses. The terrible pictures are all over the box, yet many people still smoke. They don't feel scared as they are used to seeing the warnings. Also, gambling, taking drugs, and all the bad habits will tempt you, like a demon almost. On the other hand, good deeds are not as attractive. You need to be aware to seize the root of good and keep climbing to the top. It's just not as attractive. The Buddha sighed. I've tried so hard to teach them. With all kinds of methods, I still haven't succeeded. Many of them listened and followed. But out of ten people, there will always be two or three that are stubborn and reject me. Some lack a solid foundation for kindness. They listen and follow at first. Two days later, they do bad things again. They see me again. They become good again. But it only lasts for one week. It's like that. They only improve with prompting. If you stop, they revert back. Most people are like this. Some almost achieve the fruition. However, when their attachment, greed, discrimination, and arrogance arise, it's like playing football, you're so close to scoring the winning goal, but you scored against your own team instead, you fall back into hell again. There are such people. You may think yourself cultivating well and doing good deeds, 
When I see people like these, my thoughts are, just persist for another year and you'll gain fortitude. But it's at this crucial moment. Maybe it's their karma, or not enough merits. But within this year, they fall again. Even if they've already cultivated for five years, they just need one more year. Why does this happen? Not enough merits. Too much bad karma. Therefore, Buddha felt bad for them. I feel the same way too. They lack wisdom. Sometimes, I feel that I lack energy. This lacking of energy is a feeling of helplessness. For example, arrogance. An arrogant disciple won't listen to his master. When I ask him to do something, he would question if his master was right. I met a disciple who told me that. He needed to think about whether my words were correct or not. I don't mind. I let him think about it. It's very common. Some people are more straightforward. He'd tell you his doubts. If I ask him to make a photocopy, he'd say, really? Right. Why even question this? Just do the task. There's no right or wrong in this case. They're suspicious for no reason. Some people are born suspicious of everything and are difficult to educate. Some will say, all right, master, and do it immediately. Someone asked him, did you ask master why he wants you to do it? I didn't. Why not? What if it's a trick? These cases happen. Everyone is different. I had a disciple before. He was a young guy. He was happy to see me. Master, I want to learn from you. Learn what? I don't know. Just learn from you. He'd seen me do martial arts and he wanted to learn that. But what I wanted to teach him was compassion and meditation. I think he was unsure as well. His father, being an adult, kept wondering. Does your master have a job? The kid said, I don't know. How much income does your master make? Don't let him scam you. The kid just answered. I don't know, but he's not a scammer. His father then interrogated me. Do you have income? Are you a swindler? Then, I asked the father, did your son give me money? I don't think so. What can I have scammed from him then? Ask your son how much he has learned. Everybody's cause and condition are different. After coming to me, some people would say, Oh, Master, some see me for the first time in their life, and have never heard about me before, but they feel the connection right away. They'd bow and some may even make an offering to me. We might have had a kind connection before. So when they see me, they say, This is my Master. I have to bow and make an offering to him. I've met this kind of person. We meet all kinds of people every day, with all kinds of reactions. Some are particularly devoted. Some are devoted but only for a short time. Some are devoted for a while. After their problem is resolved, they ignore you. So the cause and condition will change. Some are like the typhoon. When the energy is fully gathered, he's so devoted to you. When the typhoon is over, he ignores you as if he didn't know you. There are all kinds of causes and conditions. The Buddha had the same sentiments. Sentient beings are hard to tame and educate. He reminded earth store bodhisattva, keep going. Be persistent. Keep doing the impossible. What should you do? Bear the unbearable. Always remember to be tolerant in different situations. To bear the unbearable is to be tolerant. Sometimes, it just has to be so. Chapter 3, Observing the Karmic Conditions of Sentient Beings At that time, the Buddha's mother, Queen Maya, respectfully joined her palms and asked Earth Store Bodhisattva, Holy One, all beings created by heaven generate different karma. What karmic effects do they experience? 
Earth Store Bodhisattva then replied, There are thousands of millions of worlds and lands. Some have hells, others do not have hells. Some have women, others do not have women. Some have Buddha Dharma, others do not have Buddha Dharma. This is also the case for sound hearers, solitary Buddhas. Karmic effects of wrongdoings occur not only in hells. It's like when you curse at others, you get slapped. That's what is meant by karmic effects of wrongdoings. Occur not only in hells. It's the same principle. Karmic retributions happen everywhere. I think it totally makes sense. Queen Maya then asked further. I wish to hear about the evil realms brought on. By the karmic effects of wrongdoing of the sentient beings. Certainly, Earth Store Bodhisattva replied. This part is quite broad, so I can't list everything. I'll just go through them briefly. Queen Maya replied, Please do, I would love to hear it. Then, Earth Store Bodhisattva goes on to describe. The offenses and the karmic effects are like these. If there are sentient beings who are not filial toward their parents, who even kill them, they will fall into the hell of incessant suffering and for thousands of millions of eons, be without a time of release despite their wishes. The hell of incessant suffering is also called the relentless hell. Those who are banished to relentless hell suffer for eternity, without a day of reprieve. Imagine suffering and being tortured every moment of every day. If there are sentient beings who shed a Buddha's blood, that means hurting a Buddha, monks, or stealing their property. Scolding, slandering, and framing are considered badmouthing the Three Jewels. The Three Jewels are the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, or, disrespecting the sacred sutras. They too will fall into the hell of incessant suffering and for thousands of millions of eons be without a time of release despite their wishes. If there are sentient beings who illegally take or damage the property of the Sangha, that refers to practitioners who also handle daily operations of a monastery. So, never seize a monastery's properties illegally. That includes statues, sutras, donation money, etc. Also, never humiliate monks or nuns. Commit sexual acts in the monastery or kill or harm beings there. Sentient beings like these will fall into the hell of incessant suffering and for thousands of millions of eons be without a time of release despite their wishes. If there are sentient beings who pretend to be monastics but whose hearts are not those of monastics, these people are after more money and fame. They're not really into liberating all sentient beings. In this case, they've sinned, too.
That also refers to those who abuse the property of the Sangha. Deceive lay devotees, those who cheat Buddhists and devotees of Buddhism. These people falsely brag about their merits and virtues. To scam offering money off devotees. The same goes for those who go against the precepts. Commit various evil acts and cause harm. So not only do they break the precepts, but they actively go against it. They will fall into the hell of incessant suffering and, for thousands of millions of eons, be without a time of release despite their wishes. There's more. If there are sentient beings who steal the wealth, assets, grains, food, drink, clothing from the property of the Sangha, who take anything at all from the Sangha that is not given to them, they will fall into the hell of incessant suffering and, for thousands of millions of eons, be without a time of release despite their wishes. Scary, isn't it? Earth Store Bodhisattva then continued, saying, Holy Mother, if there are sentient beings who commit such offenses, they will fall into the hell of fivefold incessant suffering. Although they seek for their suffering to stop temporarily, that will not happen even for one thought moment. Queen Maya again asked Earth Store Bodhisattva, Why is that hell named hell of incessant suffering? Earth Store Bodhisattva replied, Holy Mother, the hells are within the great iron enclosed mountains. There are 18 of the great hells. Second to them there are 500 hells, each with a different name. And next, there are hundreds of thousands of hells, each also with a distinct name. The hell of incessant suffering is not like a small building. This hell city is more than 40,000 kilometers in its perimeter. Imagine how many people could fit inside. It's hard to count. The city walls are made entirely of iron, 5,000 kilometers in height. Once you're in, you can't get out. Atop these walls are masses of fire without a gap. Within this hell city, the various hells are interconnected, each with a different name. There is just one hell named Incessant. It is 9,000 kilometers in perimeter. Its hell walls are 500 kilometers in height, all made of iron. There are flames at the top reaching to the bottom, and flames at the bottom reaching to the top. There are also beasts and torture devices, iron snakes and iron dogs. They're all burning red from being heated. They're all burning red from being heated, and they spew fire and rush here and there in pursuit atop these hell walls. Nobody escapes the hell of incessant suffering. There's absolutely no way. In this hell, there is a bed that extends for 5,000 kilometers. It covers the entirety of hell. In this hell, there is a bed that extends for 5,000 kilometers. When one person undergoes torment there, that person sees his own body filling the bed. 
when thousands of millions of people undergo torment there. Each of them sees his own body filling the bed, too. Such are the consequences brought on by the many kinds of karma. Moreover, the wrongdoers undergo all manners of suffering. There are hundreds of thousands of yaksas and evil ghosts with teeth like swords and eyes like lightning. The yaksa's eyes are big and they glow with light. You can see it flashing and it almost looks like lightning coming from their eyes, who pull and drag the wrongdoers with bronze-clawed hands. There are also yaksas wielding large iron halberds who pierce the wrongdoers' bodies into their mouths and noses or into their abdomens and backs. They toss them into the air, catch them again, or else place them on the bed. There are also iron eagles that peck at the wrongdoer's eyes. There are also iron snakes that strangle the wrongdoer's necks. Long nails are driven into all their hundreds of joints. Their tongues are pulled out and plowed through. Their bowels are drawn out and chopped up. Molten bronze is poured into their mouths. Their bodies are bound in hot iron. They undergo myriads of deaths and as many births. They're brought back to life to suffer once more, and the cycle repeats. Such are the consequences brought about by their karma. They go through death and revival thousands of times in a day. And the cycle repeats for eternity. They pass through millions of eons. Without a time of release despite their wishes. Scary, isn't it? Also, the lifespan of hell is way longer than any ordinary world. It's countless times longer than other worlds. Our planet is predicted to last about 1.5 billion years before pollution, global warming, or being hit by an asteroid bring it to destruction. That means the destruction of all life on Earth. It's a matter of time. Hell is a different story. Hell was built to last way longer than Earth. No matter how many times we've been reincarnated, hell will still be around. It's almost indestructible. Does one's suffering end when hell undergoes destruction? Here's what Earth Store Bodhisattva says. When this, hell, undergoes destruction, they will be transferred to live and suffer in another world. When that world undergoes destruction, they will be transferred to another one. And the cycle repeats. It's like that. This is not a good situation. Moreover, this hell is called incessant because of five qualities of such karmic effects. First, torment is undergone day and night, throughout many eons without any break. Therefore, it is called incessant. Incessant means without an end. Second, one person fills this hell, many people fill it, too. They will conjure up many copies of you to fill up the hell. Not to mention it was already filled with beings. It's completely full. There's not a bit of free space in there. Therefore, it is called incessant. Third, there are instruments of torment. 
such as forks, clubs, eagles, snakes, wolves, dogs, pestles, grinders, saws, chisels, files, axes, cauldrons of boiling liquid, iron nets, iron ropes, iron donkeys, and iron horses, an endless amount of different ways to torture you, that's another reason for it to be called, incessant. Moving on to the next point, fourth, be they men or women, of any race, young or old, of upper or lower class. Dragon-like beings, deities, heavenly beings, or ghosts. Dragon-like beings, deities, heavenly beings, or ghosts. They all undergo such karmic effects based on the offenses they committed. There are no exceptions. Therefore, it is called incessant. Seems fair to me. Fifth. If beings fall into this hell, they will undergo. Myriad deaths and myriad births, each day and night, from the time of entry, and on through hundreds of thousands of eons, although they seek to pause, even for one thought moment, that will not happen. Before a moment of pain subsides, the next moment of pain kicks in. Every torment you go through, makes you think it's better to be dead than alive. It is actual torture. We're not talking about troubles in life, where its ups and downs bring you troubles and pain. This is not it. This is your body experiencing true torture. Earth Store Bodhisattva then added, this is a brief description of the hell of incessant suffering. If I were to speak in detail about the names of the hells, the instruments of torment, and also about all the sufferings there, I could not finish even in an eon. After hearing what the Earth Store Bodhisattva has said, Queen Maya sorrowfully joined her palms together. Prostrated herself in respect to the Bodhisattva and withdrew back to her seat. I'm lost for words to describe my feelings after reading this. Master, this sutra was expounded by the Buddha for Queen Maya, right? Why did the Buddha choose to expound this sutra to his mother in the Trayastrimsa heaven? All right, why the Trayastrimsa heaven? Because that's where the Buddha's mother was. She was reborn in that heaven after she passed. That's the reason. The Buddha was visiting his mother and expounded this sutra to her. Did the Buddha's mother deserve being reborn in the Trayastrimsa heaven? I think every mother who gave birth and raised their children well has more than enough merits from this selfless act and will for sure be reborn in the Trayastrimsa heaven. This is what I think. I think this sutra was expounded not only to the Buddha's mother, but to all mothers in the world. Just giving birth to your children is not enough. A mother needs to raise and educate her children. Parents are responsible for every mistake their children make. When their children break the law and are sent behind bars, you can't imagine how sad they are. To what extent? Some mothers went crazy, and some others died by suicide. Too many sad cases like that. Since this is how serious things can get, I think every mother should read this sutra. When we mess up, 
When we don't understand true principles, when we make mistakes, our children will unknowingly copy our behavior and actions. This reminds me of a reality show a practitioner once told me about. Look at this woman, what she's doing is not right. It wasn't staged, it was a reality TV show about relationship troubles. A married couple was invited as guests. They were fighting with each other and were calling for a divorce. They couldn't make up their minds so they came on this show. They wanted the audience and the judges to decide who's right. Both of them wouldn't give in. So they came to the show. So what's the story? The husband was a contractor of construction projects. He was the pillar of the family. The wife took care of the house chores, the kids and the family's money. So how did the conflict happen? During festive seasons, the wife would return to her parents' home, and she would bring gifts. Not only that, she'd clean and polish their car, and she'd buy lots of expensive gifts when she returned home. Every time, she'd spend a couple thousand to even ten thousand dollars the whole trip. The husband was not allowed to say things such as, Why did you buy so much? We're never going to use it. The wife would reply, No, I have to. I'm the oldest among my siblings. I have to show respect and honor my parents. She called her husband an ungrateful son-in-law. Her husband then said that when she visited his side of the family, she didn't buy anything. The wife said, that's not my responsibility. I'm just a daughter-in-law. And I didn't go empty-handed, I bought some vegetables for them. Those cost like $20. Yet the shoes she buys are at least $200, totally different. Also, she liked to show her total control over her husband. When she went out partying with her friends, she would tell her husband to pick her up at a certain time, but then make him wait in the parking lot for her for over four hours. She'd brag to her friends, saying, my husband wouldn't have the guts to defy me. If I asked him to wait for me for four hours, he'd dare not leave. Whenever they had a conflict, she'd pack up the family savings checkbook and the property ownership certificate, and go back to her parents' home. An audience member commented, even if you guys divorce and you get 50%, you have no right to take all of the shared property and assets. I can do whatever I want, this is my family's money. If he has any funny thoughts, I'll take all of the money from him. Everyone said that it was against the law. This is my family, I'm the law. Sure, you can say that and think that way. Your husband can fear you and tolerate you. Do you think that's true though? That he's afraid of you? He just doesn't want his kids to end up with no home. And maybe he didn't want to worry his parents. So he swallowed everything. It's tragic to have a partner like his wife, but he chose to bear it all in silence. Now, back to the wife. As a mother, she's going to have her own son or daughter-in-law someday. How would they treat her? Maybe confiscate her savings, hit her or kick her out of the house. They may ship her off to a senior center or even physically abuse her. She won't be able to tell anyone then. A lot of bad karma stems from ignorant parents. They set the example for their kids. Your children see everything you do and they learn from you.
your children have learned from you. And, one day, they may do the same to you. Then you will understand. In some families with three generations, the seniors are often neglected. They're considered lucky if their grandchildren care about them. If not, they'd have to starve because they're not taken care of. Let not even think about what it can get to when you have a daughter-in-law like this. For this lady, not only is hell waiting for her. One day, her children will do to her what they have learned from her. And it's going to be many times worse. Your days are numbered then. All parents should read this sutra. It's normal to feel pity for those who are banished to hell. But there's a reason why these people suffer in hell. They got what they deserve. They made mistakes out of ignorance when they were still alive. Look at this woman whom I mentioned. She knew what she did was wrong, but she still did it anyway. You know that hell is full of suffering yet you still check yourself in. It looks like the Buddha was expounding this sutra to his mother. But, it's also a valuable lesson to all mothers. All mothers should read this sutra. Be aware that your actions and thoughts do influence your children. We pay for our actions, that's the law of nature. Hell is not the only place where you'll suffer. Even if you were reborn on earth, you can still live a hellish life. Someone once sent me a video. It's about a woman in her 60s yelling in front of her son's house. Apparently, her son wouldn't let her in. She was making a scene to get the neighbor's attention. In the end, her son came out and knelt down in the doorway. Mom, I won't let you come in my home, no matter how much you scream. When I was three, you left my father and I and ran off with someone else. You have the audacity to come back today and accuse me of not letting you in. Do you even know how much we suffered? Most parents are selfless and great, but there still exists some that are greedy and selfish, to fulfill their own desires. They don't care if their children and parents are suffering. Sooner or later, karma will find them, they'll pay for their evil deeds. When the karma comes back, remember this natural law. Your one bad deed will attract 10,000 times of retribution. You don't reap exactly what you sow, you reap extra. Did you know this? When you make offerings to Buddha, you're rewarded more than what you offered. You always reap more than what you sow, be it kindness or evil. It will be multiplied many times over. So, when you're suffering, don't complain too much. Ask yourself what you have done to deserve it. I hope, not only for mothers, but for all of us, we should consider how to conduct ourselves well. Here, the Sutra mentions that if there are sentient beings who are not filial toward their parents, who even kill them, they will fall into the hell of incessant suffering. The same goes for those who slander, badmouth or steal from monks. Master, can we offer lights to liberate those in the hell of incessant suffering? I'll touch on this briefly. Light offerings alone won't help. It takes a powerful force to save a soul from hell and lead it to paradise. 
Even if the gates of hell are open, it's still hard to escape from there. Look at the height of the walls in hell. Who has the power to liberate souls in hell? The Buddha and earth store Bodhisattva. Understand, the flames of hell will be put out at the presence of the Buddha. That's how it is. What can we do, as mortals without the might of the Buddha? We offer lights in front of the Buddha, for our deceased ancestors, and our deceased, unborn children. And maybe we could do it for our close acquaintances, too. We offer lights in front of the Buddha, praying to him to look after our relatives. For example, if your child does badly in his studies, you make a light offering and wish for wisdom for your child. If your child's career looks bleak, do the same and ask for the Buddha's help. That's what we should do. We mortals are too weak to change things, to improve bad situations that happen due to karmic reasons. We need the Buddha's power. Not only do we help to improve our loved one's situation, we need to improve ourselves too. Don't end up a selfish person. Selfish people always want people around them to behave the way they want. For example, they force you to dress or style your hair the way they like. They say, it's for your own good, when in fact they just want your compliance. It's selfishness when people attempt to control you, or force you to appear in a certain way that pleases them. When people tell you to stop doing what you like, it's a way to show their dominion over you. It's like when you enter the army. During training, you learn to follow all kinds of commands. No matter the weather, you have to carry out anything that's asked of you. Soldiers are trained to be disciplined. It's their job to take orders. But people around you are not your commanders. They have no right to order you around to make themselves happy. This kind of people are doing wrong things and don't even know it. Selfish people are not aware of their growing selfishness. Disasters happen when people crave too much dominion over others. There's no telling what will result from their harsh and senseless behavior. Act and speak with kindness. Kindness and compassion are keys to self-liberation. If you've no idea where to start, try making some offerings first. Learn to give. Everyone should read this sutra. The gruesome description of hell might scare you a little bit. But it'll make you think twice before you act. The fear will curb your unreasonable actions, and then it'll change your mind. This sutra is a guide to a way out. I hope you'll become a kind and wise person with good behavior. Be compassionate regardless of whom or what you come across. Your family, strangers, animals, plants, etc. Gratitude and kindness always lead to the best results. Show some respect and filial piety to your elders. This is important. Do it now because it'll be too late when karma strikes. When you ignore a small wound on your leg, it may spread and the leg may need to be amputated. You should have treated it earlier when you could. But you chose to ignore it and let it deteriorate. So, when you know something is wrong, change it immediately to make yourself suffer less in the future. I believe everyone here won't end up in hell easily. Because they've been told about the sufferings in hell.
I hope you've now awoken from your ignorance and are ready to become a kind and compassionate person. I wish you auspiciousness. Received. I wish you a long life. Received. Also, joy and happiness. Received. See you next time. Thank you, Master.
下的红点里，人生就此欢喜。我快乐了，我健康了，我幸福了，我美丽了。在茫茫人海之中，让我与你相遇。小小的红点滴，人生变得神奇。我智慧了，我宽容了，我慈悲了，我自在了。因为有了你，生命变得更坚定。下的红点里，人生就此欢喜。我快乐了，我健康了，我幸福了，我美丽了。在茫茫人海之中，让我与你相遇。小小的红点里。人生变得神奇，我智慧了。